On behalf of uh, Professor Stam and the director of the Dickey Center, uh, Ambassador Ken Yalowitz, I'd like to uh, welcome you to this event. The importance and salience of the grim topic we're going to discuss tonight hardly needs introduction from me, but may I just say a few words uh, to welcome our two guests, two guests who bring extraordinary and different kinds of expertise to the subject at hand. <coughs> Sitting right here, I will indicate them to you, is <laughs> Professor Robert Pape of the University of Chicago's Political Science Department, who used to be uh, a colleague here at uh, Dartmouth. To our great regret, he was stolen by the University of Chicago. He is a uh, noted expert on international security affairs, <coughs> the author of many books and articles, but most important for the tonight's subject. He is the author of the book, Dying to Win, The Strategic Logic of Suicide Terrorism. He has appeared widely and his, uh, in uh, various uh, media and other public settings. He is certainly accustomed to meetings like the one we are having tonight. And I think it's fair to say that Professor Pape is, among political scientists, probably the best known expert, indeed <coughs> the best known expert on this particular subject. Sitting to his left is Ram Sidi. He is a veteran member of Israel's counterterrorism establishment. This is a man with practical experience. He has served as a team commander with an undercover unit of the Israeli Defense Forces, which is still classified. I can only refer to it in very vague terms. If our guest chooses to refer to it in more precise terms, that will be up to him. I wouldn't risk such a move myself. Um, so the format for tonight is very straightforward. Uh, first, <coughs> Professor Pape will give you 20, 25 minute presentation on his argument about what motivates people to kill themselves in order to kill others. That will be followed by uh, Mr. C.D. And then each will have five minutes to respond to each other. And then we will open up to you, the audience, to ask some questions. Well, Bob, th thank you so much, Bill. Yeah, thank you so much. It, it's a special delight to come back to Dartmouth. Um, as Bill indicated, over the last few months since my book came out, I've been really pleased to have a number of good opportunities. Um, and uh, some of those are quite special, too. I've been on Capitol Hill four times, uh, been on, as many of you probably know, on television a number of times. But coming back to Dartmouth, a place where I taught for five years, that I loved for five years, that I enjoyed for five years, is really special. My family also got to come. That is a very special thing. I have a wife and three children. Um, I see many friends in the audience. Uh, some of you may not know that one of the reasons I left had to do with uh, educating one of my children who has a special need. Um, but I also want to tell you that we've all come back, and last night when we were at Lou's, uh, which we just barely got to by three, um, I asked my son, geez, what's your first impression? He's 14 years old, and he said, Dad, it's just good times, and it's all the pleasant things have been coming back. And so thank you very much for, uh, for, for having us here. We really enjoyed it. Suicide terrorism has been rising around the world, but there's great confusion about why. Since many of the attacks, including 9-11, have been perpetrated by Muslim suicide terrorists, many have assumed that Islamic fundamentalism must be the obvious central cause. However, this presumed connection between suicide terrorism and Islamic fundamentalism is misleading and may be leading to domestic and foreign policies that are likely to worsen our situation. Over the last few years, I've collected the first complete database of every suicide terrorist attack around the world from 1980 to early 2004, and then I've just recently updated that database for the key case of Iraq through December, the end of 2005. When I published the initial version of this database as an academic article in 2003, I knew that no academic and no think tank had collected such a database, but I was surprised when I was contacted by our Department of Defense. As some of you may know, our Defense Department, Department of State, well, our government has been collecting ordinary terrorism statistics uh, around the world going back decades. It's done in Monterey, California. What I didn't know until then <laughs> was that we didn't begin to track suicide terrorism until the fall of 2000. 
So the Defense Department was quite eager to get a hold of my data. And if you go and look at my book in the back, you'll see that even though I will disagree with certain policies here of the administration, uh, the Defense Department has been one of the big funders of the research and expansion of this research, which has led to dying to win. I also want to point out uh, that this has been funded generously by the Carnegie Corporation, Argonne National Laboratory, and the University of Chicago itself, and I thank them all for their generous support. I am now the director of the Chicago Project on Suicide Terrorism, which collects information on terrorism around the world, not only in English, but in all key native languages as well, Arabic, Hebrew, Tamil, and Russian, and I'll say a few more words about that. This survey examines all the key open source literature from the suicide terrorist groups themselves, from the target countries under attack, and also from the key journalistic sources, both in hard copy and on the web, things like Phibis and Lexis. In addition, we have sent people to conduct international research in Cairo and Beirut to buy things on the black market. What I'm about to tell you today will be summaries and summary statistics but this is uh, not just a list of lists, but represents a rather large amount of new information. And I brought a few examples so that you could see what I mean. The Tamil Tigers are a major suicide terrorist group, and I'll tell you more about them. They're in Sri Lanka in a moment. But it may come as a surprise to you to learn that suicide terrorist groups in general are quite proud of their activities in their local communities. This glossy yearbook-like album is a celebration by the Tamil Tigers of their black tigers, which are their suicide commandos, their suicide attackers. And this is not pictures of gory, bloody bodies. These are pictures, as you can probably see, of the actual suicide attackers. And not simply their pictures, their names, their birthplaces, their ages, other socioeconomic information about them is contained in here and well. It's, in, it's published not for our consumption, it's published in Jaffna, <laughs> which is the Tamil capital in Sri Lanka, for circulation around Jaffna. And um, this is uh, obviously very important to get. And one of the things that you might like to know is when I went to our counterterrorism center, which is at an undisclosed location in Washington, <laughs> D.C., and I was talking to a series of FBI and CIA terrorist experts about this, after my talk, the person, people who did the Tamil desk, the Sri Lankan desk, came down to get a look at this, <laughs> because this is something that uh, at least they were very interested in as well. Uh, and yes, it is true that the um, Defense Department has copies of all the data um, that I'm, 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 I'm going to tell you about. Uh, also, just in case you're curious, uh, this is an example of the dozens of binders that we have. Um, we often have multiple sources of information about the attacks, and what I do is I just collect it. Of course, we put some things on Excel and computers, but I actually collect in hard copy the uh, factual basis of the information, and I like to use a two-source verification rule, that is two independent sources of data for each fact that I'm about to tell you. Um, about. So, the data. The data shows that suicide terrorism and ordinary terrorism have been moving in opposite directions. From the mid 1980s to 2003, terrorist incidents of all types have declined nearly in half, while at the same time, suicide terrorism. That small amount of terrorism, just making about 3% of the uh, ordinary terrorism incidents, has been skyrocketing from an average of three attacks per year around the world in the 1980s to nearly 50 a year in 2002 and 2003. And in a bit, you'll see some numbers for 2005, which will show you a new record overall. These facts help to explain why there was such a failure of imagination before 9-11. Since we were not tracking suicide terrorism, but were tracking terrorism, as terrorism was going down, since we weren't tracking suicide terrorism, it was hard to see that the threat was actually growing. The data also shows that Islamic fundamentalism is not as closely associated with suicide terrorism as many people think. Overall, from 1980 to the end of 2003, there were 15 completed suicide terrorist attacks worldwide, 
Uh, those involved, by the way, 462 suicide terrorists. There are more uh, terrorists who killed themselves than attacks because many of the attacks were team attacks. But for this presentation, I'll just tell you about the attacks. The world leader during that period is the Tamil Tigers in Sri Lanka. They're a Marxist group, a secular group, a Hindu group. The Tamil Tigers in Sri Lanka have done more suicide terrorist attacks than Hamas or Islamic Jihad. Further, at least 30% of Muslim suicide terrorist attacks were by secular groups such as the PKK in Turkey. Overall, at least 50% of all suicide terrorism around the world since 1980 has not been associated with Islamic fundamentalism. Because the Tamil Tigers are unfamiliar, I thought it would be helpful to show you that the Tamil Tigers conduct a suicide terrorist attack in the ordinary sense of that term. I'm sure many of you know that suicide terrorist groups like to produce martyr videos. Well, the Tamil Tigers like to go further. They like to videotape actual suicide attacks. They use those at videos to take back to Jaffna for recruitment and training purposes. These are two frames of the actual suicide assassination of Rajiv Gandhi in May 1991. In this case, the Tamil cameraman got so close that when the bomb went off, the Tamil cameraman was killed in the explosion and the Indian government was able to retrieve 10 frames of the video that was supposed to head back to Jaffna. Well, the first shows you the suicide terrorist team, one of whom is a suicide attacker at the top. And I would just ask you to make a mental note for yourself who you think in that first frame is the actual suicide attacker of that group. Well, don't be surprised if you get it wrong. Many fewer than one in four or 25% uh, pick Danu, who is the second from the left, the woman carrying the garland with the glasses. And on the second frame, uh, also Gandhi, by the way, didn't pick her. He shooed away his security guards. And in the second frame, Danu is approaching Gandhi and is putting the garland around, her neck, around his neck, about to. And in the very next second, she triggers a suicide bomb under her vest, under her garment, in a belt, killing everybody in that picture, including um, the cameraman. Well, this is not only the last second of Gandhi's life, but it's the very first instance of a suicide vest. The LTTE, the Tamil Tigers in Sri Lanka, invented the suicide vest, not the Palestinians. Um, before this point, um, it had been car bombs and truck bombs. Well, to explain suicide terrorism, my book analyzes the phenomenon at three levels. First, it seeks to explain why suicide terrorism makes sense for terrorist organizations, the strategic logic, why it gains mass support, the social logic, and what motives drive individuals to do it, the individual logic. Each level of analysis is important because suicide terrorism is conducted by non-state actors who lack the coercive apparatus of a, of a state to compel the local society and members of that society to support their operations. My book devotes essentially equal weight to each of these three, one-third, one-third, one-third. Today, I'm going to focus on the strategic logic, <laughs> partly due to time and partly because it's the logic that unifies the other three levels. Um, and I'll be glad, of course, in the question and answer period to answer questions about the other levels. What nearly all suicide terrorist attacks have in common is not religion, but a specific secular strategic goal to coerce a democratic state to withdraw military forces from territory the terrorists consider to be their homeland or prize greatly. From Lebanon to Israel to Sri Lanka to Chechnya to Kashmir, Every suicide terrorist campaign since 1980 has been waged by terrorist groups whose main goal has been to establish or maintain self-determination for a community over territory they prize. Religion is rarely the root cause, although it is often used as a tool by terrorist organizations in recruiting and in other efforts in service of the broader strategic objective. 
Three general patterns in the data support my conclusion. First, the first is the timing of suicide terrorist attacks. Suicide terrorism rarely occurs as an isolated or random event, as they would if it were merely the product of religion or any evil ideology. Instead, the attacks tend to occur in clusters that look very much like campaigns. Specifically, 301 of the 315 attacks occur in coherent, organized, strategic campaigns that terrorist groups design for mainly a political purpose. Only 5% are random or isolated attacks. This table shows you the list of all the 18 campaigns that have been going on since 1980. Five are ongoing as of today. This table reorganizes the campaigns by the disputes that produce them. As you can see, suicide terrorist campaigns are directed at gaining control of territory that the terrorists prize, and specifically at ejecting foreign combat forces from that territory. I don't mean advisors with sidearms, I mean tanks, fighter aircraft, APCs. This has been a central objective, or the major objective, of every suicide terrorist campaign since 1980. Now, I'm not saying that foreign occupation or the foreign military presence is a sufficient condition to get suicide terrorism, but the military presence or control of territory that the terrorists prize does appear to be a necessary condition. The third pattern concerns target selection. If suicide terrorism is a calculated, coercive strategy, one might expect that the strategy would be applied to target states generally viewed as especially vulnerable to coercive punishment. And, rightly or wrongly, democracies are viewed as soft, especially vulnerable to coercive punishment. And the target state of every suicide terrorist campaign has been a democracy. So the bottom line, the timing, goals, and societies targeted by suicide terrorism suggest that it is a coherent strategy designed to cause democratic states to abandon occupation or military control of territory that the terrorists prize. Al-Qaeda fits the pattern. We have long known that a major goal of Osama bin Laden has been to compel the United States to leave the Arabian Peninsula but not how this goal relates to Osama's ability to recruit suicide terrorists against us. My book is the first to collect the complete set of every Al-Qaeda suicide attacker from 1995 through early 2004. During that period, there were 71 individuals who killed themselves to carry out attacks for Osama. Of those, we have the names and nationality of 67. And as you can see from this table, the largest number, 34, come from Saudi Arabia, the majority from the Persian Gulf, the Arabian Peninsula. And notice also where they're not coming from. Iran, an Islamic fundamentalist country with 70 million people, three times the size of Saudi Arabia, zero. <laughs> Sudan an Islamic fundamentalist country about the same population as Saudi Arabia, and with a brand of Islamic fundamentalism so congenial to Osama, he chose to live there for three years in the 1990s, zero. Bangladesh, zero. Pakistan, the largest Islamic fundamentalist country on the planet, with 149 million people, two. <laughs> now, if Islamic fundamentalism were what was driving this, then we should see suicide attackers jumping out of Iran, jumping out of Sudan, jumping out of Pakistan for Osama, and that's not the pattern that we observe. Now, I'm not saying that Osama has no transnational support, but it's crucial to see that the presence of foreign combat troops on the Arabian Peninsula is Osama's best mobilization appeal. Now, since we have the complete set of Al-Qaeda suicide attackers, we can go further to assess the effect of U.S. military policies. With only one exception, Al-Qaeda suicide terrorists from 1995 to early 2004 were all nationals of various Sunni-majority countries. 
Hence, we can compare the rate at which Al-Qaeda suicide terrorists emerge from a Sunni country with and without American combat presence. And as you can see, Al-Qaeda suicide terrorists are over 10 times more likely to come from a Sunni country with American combat forces than a Sunni country without American combat forces. And this means, ladies and gentlemen, and this may be somewhat hard to hear, it's even somewhat hard to say, I'm somebody who supported having those troops there in the 1990s. This means that American military policy was likely the pivotal factor leading to 9-11. Although Islamic fundamentalism may have mattered somewhat, the stationing of tens of thousands of combat forces on the Arabian Peninsula during the 1990s probably increased the risk of Al-Qaeda suicide attacks against Americans, including 9-11, over 10 times. Just so you, just to remain, remind you, before 1990, we had never stationed combat forces on the Arabian Peninsula. Never, even going back to World War II. Now, this does not mean that we should blame ourselves for 9-11. Suicide terrorism is murder, and there's nothing that our forces did when they were stationed on the Arabian Peninsula that could possibly justify the murder of 3,000 of our civilians. Nonetheless, that should ca not cause us to ignore that Osama's best mobilization appeal, what recruits suicide attackers for him better than anything else, is the presence of American and Western combat forces on the Arabian Peninsula. Moreover, I'm not saying that all Al-Qaeda suicide attackers come from Sunni countries where we've stationed combat forces. Two-thirds do, one-third do not. One-third are transnational in nature. However, even if we look at Al-Qaeda's transnational suicide terrorists, we can see that the presence of Western combat forces on the Arabian Peninsula is a powerful motivating factor. And let me talk about the London bombers in this regard, because they're obviously part of that one-third that are transnational. And let me make four points about the London bombers. First, the Al-Qaeda group that claimed responsibility for the London attacks just two hours after the attacks and with specific operational details not yet in the press, said the London attacks were to punish Britain for British military operations in Iraq. Second, Hussein Osman. Hussein Osman is the would-be July 21st bomber that we captured in Rome. In his interrogation, Osman said, and I quote, this was not about religion, this was about Iraq. We watched films of military operations, Western military operations in Iraq. Third, Mohammed Khan. Mohammed Khan is the guy from Leeds who is the ringleader in the at one of the actual July 7th attackers. He's the ringleader. Well, Al-Qaeda released his martyr video a few months after the uh, London bombings. And Mohammed Khan says in eerily fashion, because it's with a British accent, that the London attacks were to punish Britain for British military operations on Muslim lands. And finally, the British government itself. In 2004, the British government conducted a four-volume survey of the attitudes of the 1.6 million Muslims in Britain. It was done by the Home Office. They found that between 8 and 13 percent of British Muslims believed more suicide attacks against the United States and the West were justified. And they further found the number one reason for that, Iraq. Iraq. The implication, if Al-Qaeda's transnational support were to dry up tomorrow, the group would remain a robust threat to the United States. However, if Al-Qaeda no longer drew recruits based on the anger generated from the presence of American combat forces in Sunni Muslim countries, then the remaining transnational network would pose a far smaller threat and may well simply collapse. Now, with the recent conquest of Iraq uh, and our increasing force presence on the Arabian Peninsula, Saddam is, <coughs> I'm sorry, uh, Osama has obviously failed to get us out. 
The attack data for Al-Qaeda, however, helps us to understand more clearly what Al-Qaeda's strategy has been in the intervening years. On this table, if we include the London attacks, since 9-11, Al-Qaeda has carried out over 17 suicide and other terrorist attacks, killing nearly 700 people. That's more attacks and more victims than all the years before 9-11 combined. Although many of us would have hoped that our counterterrorism efforts would have weakened the group, and we have killed and captured cadre and leaders by the measure that counts, the ability of the group to carry out attacks that can kill us, Al-Qaeda is stronger today than before 9-11. A closer look at these attacks helps us to see more clearly the specific strategy Al-Qaeda has been pursuing. Although the attacks occur across a broad geographic range and in many Muslim countries, notice the victims of the attacks. They are consistently, wherever they are, Western civilians and specifically Germans, Italians, and Australians, uh, and British countries, citizens from countries with combat forces deployed side by side with us in Afghanistan and Iraq. And if you let your eye go down the list, you'll see they're increasingly focusing on our allies in Iraq. That is, Al-Qaeda since 9-11 has been focusing on stripping us of our allies. And we know that not only because of the pattern of the attacks, but because we have an important Al-Qaeda strategy document. In September 2003, Al-Qaeda published a 42-page strategy document on radical websites about how to deal with the United States after Iraq. This document was found by Norwegian intelligence in December, and it's still sitting on the Norwegian intelligence security website. They gave it to us. We, it went all the way up to the president's, uh, Rita Hauser, who is the president's um, um, uh, national intelligence officer for terrorism. She chose to, and her committee chose to put it aside. Um, and you'll see why we don't do that anymore. <laughs> this document says directly, that after Iraq, Al-Qaeda should not seek to hit the American homeland in the short term, but instead should focus on hitting America's allies. Then it goes on at the length of 42 pages to assess whether, we should, whether they should hit Spain, Britain, or Poland. The document concludes they should hit Spain in Madrid just before the March 2004 elections because that would be the attack most likely to knock Spanish forces out of Iraq and put pressure on the British. And because we put this aside at the time, we didn't even tell the Spanish government, I think it might be helpful for you to hear some of these uh, what passages. Therefore, we say that in order to force the Spanish government to withdraw from Iraq, the resistance should be dealt painful blows. It is necessary to make utmost use of the upcoming general election in Spain in March of next year. We think that the Spanish government could not tolerate more than two, maximum three blows, after which it will have to withdraw as a result of popular pressure. If its troops still remain in Iraq after these blows, then the victory of the Socialist Party is almost secured and the withdrawal of Spanish forces will be on its electoral program. Lastly, we emphasize that a withdrawal of Spanish forces from Iraq would put huge pressure on the British in Iraq. Well, of course, those events happened, just as the document called for, and the London attacks that we witnessed were simply the next step of Al-Qaeda executing its strategic logic. Now, I also want to say we can't take much comfort in the idea, however, that somehow we're off the hook that uh, they're going after our allies, isn't that great, we're home free. Well, there's good reason to call your attention to Osama's most recent um, statement in this regard. Osama had been quiet for over a year. Well, just a few weeks ago, he released his, most, uh, re his uh, statement, and if you go to the BBC website, you'll be able to read the entire statement, not just a soundbite on CNN. And if you read that statement, you will see Osama says, for the past few years, we've been focusing on hitting the capitals of European countries with forces side by side with the United States and Iraq. Now, we're going to turn to American 
targets. Now we're going to turn to American targets. Um, those statements in the past by either um, bin Laden or um, um, al-Zahari have corresponded within a month or so um, uh, to, of an attack about two-thirds of the time. That's just uh, not quite enough uh, to have any statistical significance, uh, but it is enough to take, get you to take that seriously. And I have reason to believe we are, as a government, taking that seriously. I have no doubt in my mind from people I've talked to. Say a few words about Iraq before I end. Iraq is a prime example of the strategic logic of suicide terrorism. Before our invasion of March 2003, Iraq had never experienced a suicide terrorist attack in its history. Since our invasion, suicide terrorism has been rising dramatically, and as you can see, doubling every year that we've had 140,000 combat forces stationed in the country. Although many people in the press, uh, even experts I really res expect, re respect and admire, say um, that there's no logic or coherence to the suicide attacks, a look at the actual geography and targets of the attacks shows a fairly consistent strategy, in fact, one that's remained remarkably consistent even as the attacks have doubled. Um, if you look, the, the insurgents are following a fairly standard model of insurgency. Year after year, about half of the attacks are falling in the capital city. The rest are more or less evenly distributed around the country. This is normal for insurgents. Uh, insurgents often want to focus their attacks on the capital city because they're trying to undermine confidence in the population that the government can provide security. And if you can't secure your um, capital, where can you get security? Let's look at the targets. Over 75% actually, again, remarkably consistent as those attacks have doubled year after year, are against military and political targets, such as government buildings, police convoys, police stations, uh, recruiting stations, Western troops, and Western agencies. And only 15 to 25 percent have been against local Iraqi civilians not working for the Iraqi government. It's important to tell you that when you read a story in the paper, whether it's the Valley News or New York Times, it doesn't matter, the first story in a, from a suicide attack in Iraq often says there was an attack against civilians. That's, however, often followed up in the next days on page 27, 28, not necessarily the front page, by some more detail about who those civilians were. They were standing in line, waiting to join the security forces, uh, or other ways looking for work from the Iraqi government. This is not the pattern of attacks that says uh, Zarqari is, is, is starting the war with the Shia. <laughs> he may want a civil war with the Shia. They may do that in the future, but that isn't what's happened uh, so far. Instead, this pattern of attack suggests a goal to prevent the establishment of a government under the control of the United States. To do this, the terrorists are attacking targets that they hope would undermine confidence of the Iraqi population in the Iraqi government's ability to maintain order, and especially to discourage Kurds and Sunnis from cooperating with that government. What fuels support for suicide terrorism, not only, but mainly, is the presence of American ground forces. We are widely viewed as the power behind the throne. Zarqawi almost never misses an opportunity to underscore this. And when he does, what does he do? He simply recounts that it was the American military that toppled the previous regime, it's the American military that's setting the conditions for the current regime, and it's the American military that directs all military force in Iraq, even by the Iraqi government. That is a widely accepted perception. We have public opinion polls inside Iraq. Um, Anthony Cordesman has, has done this uh, the best. If you Google Anthony Cordesman and you look for opinion polls, you will find that our coalition, American opinion polls in Iraq, support the view that we are viewed as the power behind the throne. Moreover, this tightly links to Zarqawi's strategy. He laid out his strategy in January 2004 in his famous letter to Osama bin Laden. If you go and read the letter, 
you will see that Zarqawi says he plans to conduct a suicide terrorist camp, suicide campaign, not terrorist, you can call it terrorist, suicide campaign where he's going to target um, uh, the Iraqi security organs and Western agents in Iraq because, and these are his words, those are the eyes, ears, and hands of the American occupier. I'm often asked questions about who the identity of the Iraqi suicide terrorists. At the moment, their identity is murky. We can only code about 10 to 12 percent of the identity of the Iraqi suicide terrorists. And I'm not persuaded that our government, especially after having spent so much time briefing them lately, is actually in a position to do that much better. That's normal, by the way, in the early years, yes, early years of a suicide terrorist campaign. Be glad to tell you more about that if you want in the Q&A. But you should know that right now, the two largest groups appear to be coming from Iraqi Sunnis and Saudis, the next largest from Syria, the next largest from Kuwait. That is, they're coming either from Iraq itself or from the immediately adjacent countries, many of whom are on our hit list <laughs> to go after next. Notice where they're not coming from. Iran, zero. Sudan, zero. Pakistan, zero. <laughs> now, of course, we only have 10 to 12 percent of the data. But the fact is, if uh, this was really a product of Islamic fundamentalism, we should be suicide terrorists hopping out of Iran and hopping out of Pakistan. And again, that's not what we see. So I'm afraid to tell you, but the threat from Al Qaeda is growing, and the war on terrorism is heading south. Not the only reason, but a key reason is that we have been waging that war on a faulty premise the faulty premise that suicide terrorism is mainly a product of Islamic fundamentalism. Although there are multiple causes, the threat we face is not driven merely by an evil ideology, but by the sustained presence of American and Western combat forces on the Arabian Peninsula. On 9-11, we had 12,000 combat forces on the Arabian Peninsula, 5,000 in Saudi, 7,000 on the other in other countries. Today, we have over 140,000. And as those numbers of troops go have gone up, suicide terrorism, both by Al Qaeda and out, out of Iraq, have grown up side by side. Now, this does not mean that we should simply cut and run. We have a vital interest in oil in the Persian Gulf, and we can't walk away from that interest. Instead, oops, sorry, I've been offering three points to the Bush administration. First, Al Qaeda must be our top priority. Iran and North Korea are important to be sure, but it is Al Qaeda that's actively planning to kill Americans, and we have lost sight of that over the last three years. Second, in Iraq, over the next year, the United States should begin a gradual withdrawal of troops, and we should at the same time completely transfer responsibility for the security of Iraq to the Iraqi government. It should be the government of Iraq that builds the Iraqi army and directs it, not the American military. Over the next three years, the United States should shift to a new strategy for securing our interest in oil in the Persian Gulf, offshore balancing. In fact, we've done this before and did for decades. In the 1970s and 80s, the United States successfully secured our access to oil without stationing a single combat soldier on the Arabian Peninsula. Instead, we formed an alliance with Iraq and Saudi Arabia, which we can do again. We stationed numerous aircraft carriers off the coast, and air power is more effective today than 30 years ago. And we maintained a basing infrastructure of bases without troops but bases so that we could rapidly deploy hundreds of thousands of ground troops to the, to the peninsula in a crisis. Well, that strategy of offshore balancing works splendidly against Saddam Hussein to reverse his aggression against Kuwait, and offshore balancing is, again, our best strategy to secure our interests in oil, prevent the rise of a new generation of suicide terrorists coming at us, and it's a strategy that we can maintain, not just by our fingernails for a year or two, but for decades, which is what we're going to need given our dependence on oil. Over the last 10 years, our enemies have been dying to win. But with the right strategy, it's America that's poised for victory. Thank you. Yeah, 
Sorry, I went a little long. Can you hear me? What, what is this? Yeah, let's do it. I think this is working right maybe here. Okay, now do you hear? Good afternoon, it's a pleasure to be here at Dartmouth. I will speak mainly about the Palestinian organization because these are the organizations that uh, I know the most. My knowledge doesn't come uh, from reading books or making research or being a diplomat, but uh, mainly from the field. I served many years as a special uh, forces uh, member my job was to look for these terrorists and to try to catch them beforehand. And uh, <coughs> therefore, I had to learn them and to study them. And uh, one thing needs to be understood, to my opinion. There are many uh <coughs> suicide bombing uh, campaigns. But they are not conducted by one organization. There is no one roof organization that conducts them all. Therefore you cannot really address the subject as one group. And you will have to speak about each organization separately and to analyze each organization differently and separately to see what's their motives and what's their goals. And it doesn't mean that if the majority of organizations share a certain view that the other does as well. I will speak mainly about, uh, as I said, the Palestinian uh, groups, which is Fatah, Harakat uh, al-Tahrir <coughs> al-Palestinia, which I'll explain later on what it means. When you listen to the names, the full names, not just the shorten, it gives you more uh, understanding about what the idea of the organization, or what the goals behind it. The Hamas. Harakat El Mukauma El Islamia and Harakat El Islamic El Jihad Fi Palestine, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad. Before I will start my lecture, I want to show you a short presentation, really short, it's a few pictures. Uh, now, they are graphic, they are bloody, so if someone thinks that he cannot watch it, he shouldn't. The reason I do it is not in order to shock you, but for simply, A, to show where I come from and uh, where I gain my knowledge. And second, to show you what a successful suicide bombing or suicide terror attack look like. <coughs> and to understand what a deadly, horrific attack it is on innocent civilians. And that's because I believe that the suicide bombers are simply not the issue. The issue is the terror organization, the suicide bombers are just a weapon. In Israel, we manage, and I will speak about it later, to deal with the problem and to dramatically slim down the numbers of suicide attacks by 75 or 85 percent. So the Hamas moved to another uh, way of uh, fighting, and they moved to uh, Qassam missiles. It doesn't matter. It's a weapon. I don't have any intention to legitimate or delegitimate this use of a weapon, but the cause of the organization by using it. The 
first two pictures was, were from a suicide in the bar restaurant. And this is one of the problems. The suicide attackers choose a civilian target. They go into a restaurant not in order to kill soldiers, in order to kill civilians and to make the population in this area later on frightened and terrorized. This is why it's called terror organizations. This is what the body looks like after the suicide bombing. This is the suicide himself. To my opinion, it's true. In most cases, when it comes to the Palestinian organizations, they are not being exploited, which means they're doing willingly, knowing what they're doing, but still, they are being deceived by certain extremist clerics of the uh, Islamic religions that, to my opinion, I will speak about it later, does not represent the Islam. Again, the terrorist. This is what the bus looked like after a suicide attack. Nothing is left. And again, this is Cafe Moment, a uh, restaurant. These are the targets, civilian targets with no soldiers. If you look at the bodies, you won't find uniform there, simply because there are no soldiers there. And when you go to attack in a disco club, when the age of the clubbers are 16 to 18, you are not expected to find soldiers there. When addressing the subject of suicide terrorists, and I'm talking now about the Islamic organizations, first we need to understand and to know a little bit the Islamic society. It's very important. By the law of Islam, it's forbidden to commit suicide. If you commit suicide, intihar, intihar in Arabic, you're a sinner. It's something you cannot do, and if you watch the Arabic societies, you will find, relatively to the Western society, low numbers of suicides on a secular base because it's simply illegal. What is legal is what they call istishhad, the self-sacrificing. This is legal. This is more than legal, it's welcome. And istishhad is the self-sacrificing for the sake of Allah which is part of the jihad, the holy war. Why it's important to understand? When it comes to Palestinian, sorry, to Islamic organizations, they cannot make suicide just for secular reason, just to gain a land back. It's illegal. We're talking about the tradition society. It would not pass. It will not be accepted. Therefore, they, they had to find the clerics the, the imams that will approve it. Without it, it cannot go. One might say then, okay, they'll have to find those imams, but they just use it as a manipulation to get the approval so they can use this type of a weapon. I disagree and I will explain why. So this is one thing you need to understand. Suicide, it's illegal by Muslim society. Self-sacrificing is legal. And this is what they are doing. I spoke to many terrorists. I met many terrorists one-on-one, -on -one, some of them in the Israeli prison, some in my mission catching them. And when you speak to them about suicide bombers, they just look at you, at you not knowing what are you talking about. We don't have suiciders. Simply, it's not exist. They don't tell you we don't have suicide, we have self-sacrificing. They just don't cooperate. Until you describe a certain operation, it says, ah, that's something else. This is not a suicide person. This is someone that self-sacrifices himself for the cause. <coughs> now, in the Quran, there's only one place that it's mentioned this forbidden to kill or to commit suicide. It's in Surah number four, if someone is familiar with the Quran, line number 29. And what it says there in Arabic is, لَتَتْكُلُوا in nafsukum." Now that's very tricky. The, the official translation will, will be, kill not one another. 
There were many disputes about this uh, line. What does it mean? <coughs> Whether it means not to kill at all or, or it's a forbidden not to commit suicide. When the Islamic law started to be formed, somewhere around the, the Middle Ages, the Sunni uh, clerics, and this is an important point uh, to understand because before I, uh, I heard the, the argument why the Iranians does not cooperate with Al-Qaeda, they will never cooperate. This is something you need to understand. The Iranians are Shiites and the Al-Qaeda are Sunnis. The Sunnis see the Shiites as infidels. They will not use them. <coughs> anyway, the Sunni clerics took the approach that suicide in Tahar is forbidden, and this is the meaning of this uh, sentence for them. And from that on, it became the, the common understanding of this commandment. And in the 20th century, it became the, the main... Uh, which is the mainstream, okay? No, no Islamic will argue about that, that suicide is illegal. And it's legal only if you do it uh, for the sake of Allah and for the war of jihad. Now, war of jihad, and I'm talking only about the military jihad. Jihad is a very big uh, issue. There are many aspects to it, but what's important for our argument is the military type of it because suicide bombers are part of the jihad if they are part of jihad. You have the offensive jihad, which means the actual fight to enlarge the places that the law of Islam will be taking over. And you have the offensive jihad, which means to fight only the places that were once had the law of Islam valid, and therefore it is the duty of all believer to do all he can to bring those places back under the law of Islam. And that means also to commit the istishhad, the self-sacrificing, what we call suicide. They don't see it as a suicide. Those areas are not just areas that you have Westerns today. For them, and I spoke to many terrorists, these are part of Europe, Spain. There was once Islamic law there, they should go back. This is former Yugoslavia, and so on. <clears throat> now, for them, it's true. It's a long-term goal. So they are willing to make short-term uh, agreements in order to regain the power and achieve this goal. That's why bin Laden can say, and he carefully chooses words. It's not randomly that he chooses words. He said, for the short run, we can stop. We can leave the American for the short run. <coughs> Let's speak about the organizations. The first of our organization will be the, the Fatah, Harakat El Tahrir El Palestinia. It's the resistant the liberation movement of Palestine. Already from the name, you can see that indeed the goal is Palestine. And indeed the Fatah, it's a secular organization. And this is his goal. Originally, he put his in agenda the destruction of Israel, but they were willing to take it out. And the reason they were willing to take it out, because they don't have a religious goal. Recruiting in the Fatah, it's always on a secular base. Religion is never, never a factor. Recruiting is random. And they never decide in advance, what will you do? Therefore, in the case of the Fatah, you can see many times that they exploit certain type of vulnerabilities among people in order to recruit them to become suicide bombers. If it's uh, mental retardations, or a clinical depression, or women that uh, uh, violated the family honor and are going to be killed by the family anyway, and for them it's a choice either be killed like that or like that, or people that collaborated with Israel. Therefore, the training for the suicide bomber when it comes to Fatah 
It's very short. It can be a couple of days, sometimes it can be two hours. They deal only with the technical, technical part. They will teach you how to use the switch, and that's it. And they will send you very fast so you won't change your mind. It doesn't mean that they don't also use suiciders that really wanted to do it. But very often they use vulnerabilities and weaknesses. Examples, you can see the 14-year-old uh, kid that was uh, in 2004 was captured in Kabara crossing point. It was a retarded kid that was given 100 shekels to do it. Came to the crossing point, was spotted by the soldiers, started to cry. They disarmed the, the vest and they gave him back to the Palestinian Authority. We, we had nothing to do with him. Other examples, there are many. I'll give you just a few. There's uh, Wafa Idris. She committed suicide in 2002. Again, she was divorced after nine years of marriage because she couldn't get pregnant. Basically, she became a person that does not belong, a non-normative person. And it was easy to recruit her. Another example, we have uh, Iyat El Haras. She was 18 year old. Again, she wanted to commit suicide because uh, the family did not agree to her choice of husband. But this is only in the case of Fatah, okay? It's different when we are going to the other organizations. Therefore, in the Fatah, you will see that they are willing to talk about the two nations' state solution. They are willing to talk about the solution of both Israeli states side by side to a Palestinian state. They are willing to talk about going to an agreement on the 67 border. There is certain ground <coughs> of negotiation because the, the aim is, I agree, secular. When they make the movie of the suicide, they pay attention. Often they just don't make a movie because they don't have the time. They recruited the guy, as I said, very fast, no time for a movie. But when they do make a movie, the guy or the girl is being presented with a, an AK-47 on one hand, a rifle, Kalashnikov, and the flag of the organization on the other hand or behind him, whatever. And that goes both for the Fatah and its two sub-organizations. They have the Tanzim, which is an organization that was uh, built by Arafat in 1994 when he came. That's the first thing when he arrived in Gaza, he built the Tanzim. The idea of the Tanzim was to be his personal uh, army force. And this is also a strategy. They make subgroups. They claim that these subgroups are not under their control. And then when they negotiate with you, they can use the subgroups to do something that was not agreed. So we have the Tanzim, and we have the Katayeb Shuhada El Aqsa, the uh, El Aqsa Brigade, the Martyr of El Aqsa Brigade. The El Aqsa Brigade Martyr in charge of few things when it comes to the Fatah. First, they are the ones that commit the suicide bombing. Second, they deal with criminal activities. And third, they deal with violent activities that their main purpose or the only purpose is to gain political power. Such an example was the assassinating of the brother of the mayor of Nablus. <coughs> The Hamas, Harakat El Tahrir El Islamia, the Islamic resisting group. Palestine is not mentioned in the name. Only the Islamic resisting group. Now, before I start to speak about the Hamas, I would like to quote from an interview that was done. Can you stand over there? We can hear you better. Yes. Uh, <coughs> I would like to quote from an interview that was done with Umni Dal. Umni Dal was one of the candidates 
for this election by Hamas. She is known also as Um al Shuhada, the mother of martyrs, of Shahids. The reason she has 10 uh, kids, she sent three of them uh, to become Shahids. And she said that she will send the rest if uh, they will want, because simply it's not between her and them, but between them and God, and they are more, God is more important than them. In that interview that was done in the in 22nd of December 2005, she was asked, what does the, the word peace mean to you? And her answer was, peace means the liberation of all Palestine from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. When this is accomplished, if they want peace, we will be ready. They may live under the banner of Islamic State. That is the future of Palestine that we are striving towards. The Hamas, with the subgroup, Azadin al-Qassam, which is the group, the military part of uh, Hamas, and this is important, again, it's strategy. Hamas is a charity organization, the way it claims. So when you give money to Hamas, you don't give it to terrorism. The one that deal with terrorism is Azadin al qassam It's the same, the same organization. And <coughs> the founders of the organization are the ones that control it, which means Sheikh Yassin, late Sheikh Yassin, may rest in peace, was conducting all the activities. And we have the proofs that he was giving the approval to activities, he was giving the money, and he was knowing about, he knew about every attack that was carried out. He wasn't just a, uh, religious uh, leader. Now, Hamas, it's, religi it's a religious organization. Everything is done by the religious criteria. First, the recruiting. There is no random recruiting when it comes to Hamas. They don't use suicide bombers on a random basis. They don't exploit any vulnerabilities. They always look for the long-term member. In order to become a member in Hamas, you need to come to the mosque every day to prove that you have a, a very good knowledge in Quran. Then you can be accepted to one of the committees. It can be a charity committee, an armed committee, etc., fundraising, etc. Without being in one of those committees for a certain time, you cannot become a combatant or a suicide bomber. Impossible, okay? There is no one day recruiting. Once you've been to one of these committees at the Hamas for a long time and you proved yourself, then you can become a member of the active uh, group. When they recruit you to the active uh, group, everything is done in advance, which means they <coughs> already, when recruiting you, deciding what will you be. If it's a commander or a low rank member, or <coughs> that you will become a, a suicide bomber, which is a next stage, etc. And the watertight is very important here. They are very uh, classified. They will not link from one group to another. Okay, suicide bomber will not tell someone that was chosen to be another type of combatant what's going on in that part. Once you pass the committee and you decided that you want to be a bomber and you proved yourself in the committees that <coughs> you are devoted enough to the cause, devoted enough means that you go every day to the mosque and you learn Quran. Once you achieve that, you can become a suicide bomber. Once you decide the suicide bomber, the training is as follows. If you remember with the Fatah, it was only technical training, which means you learn how to operate the vest, and that's it. With the Hamas, it goes like that. First part of the training, it's religious training, and it goes for weeks, not for hours, not for a few days. 
You have to go to the mosque every day to learn and to prove that you gain a very high knowledge in the Quran. Once you pass that stage, you move to the technical stage, where you'll be taught how to use the vest, who is going to be your operator, who will meet you, etc. all the technical details. Once you finish that, we are moving to the making of the movie. You must always make a movie. And if you look at the movies, on one hand, it's the rifle, the AK-47. The other end, the Quran. Always religious symbols. They will never fail. You will not see one movie that will be without it. I met many terrorists of the Hamas. And when I speak to them, this is the message. First, we cannot make any agreement with you, simply because the land of Palestine is not ours, does not belong to us. It belongs to Allah. Therefore, we cannot negotiate it. I cannot negotiate something that does not belong to me. Second, they don't want you to go back to the 67 border. They want you to leave Israel totally. They want Israel, as Omnidal said, from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. Those who don't, are not familiar with the map, this is all of Israel, including Tel Aviv. And their objective is first leave we will make here the Islamic State, and then, only then, if you like, if you wish, you may come back, live under the Islamic State, paying the jizya, which is the head tax, and basically live according to the Islamic rule for non-Muslim living under the Islam. The time is irrelevant for them. That can happen now. In 10 years, in 50 years, in 100 years, it doesn't matter. They have the time. The most they can do at the meantime is to make hudnas. Now, it's important to understand the terminology, because sometimes they talk to us with certain words, and we, not, we don't understand what they mean. When they say occupy territories, they don't mean just to geographical land to the 67 border, etc. They mean, and I'm saying what they tell me, not what I understand from them. They said to me, listen, Ram, when we said occupy territories, this is Dar al-Islam, the word of Islam, the war where the law of Islam was valid. True, now it's Israel, because this is all we can afford. But in the future, it will be Europe, etc. Hudna, when they said they are going to go for a Hudna, we perceive it as a ceasefire. Hudna is not a ceasefire. Ceasefire is stopping of a fight in order to negotiate to stop the fight. This is a ceasefire. Hudna, it's a temporary stop of the fight that have a specific meaning, an attempt, sorry. And the, the specific attempt of this agreement is to regroup yourself, to regain your power in order to attack again and achieve your long-term goal. And they think in a long-term goal, not in a short-term goal. The Palestinian Islamic Jihad. The reason there's the word Palestinian there is just to refer it from the uh, Muslim, uh, from the Egyptian Islamic Jihad. That's the only reason. Now, the Islamic Jihad is quite similar to the Hamas. Everything is with religious criteria. Everything goes according to the Quran with a few differences. First of all, they don't have all the committees. They don't see themselves as a movement that needs to uh, also take care of the society. They have one goal. This is the jihad goal. 
That's why they also call themselves Islamic Jihad, the holy war for Islam. Start with Israel and then move on to <coughs> other countries. And therefore, they have only the military part. They have, you don't see any subgroups. It's the Islamic Jihad, that's it. Religious uh, recruiting is similar to the Hamas, a bit harder. As I said, they don't have the committees. But in order to uh, participate the jihad, the Islamic Jihad, you need to have two type of recommendations. A, first recommendation from one of the organization. And the second has to be from a religious figure that knows you. Knows you means that he see that you go to the mosque every day and you show a certain knowledge in the Quran, etc. They also don't exploit any vulnerabilities in people. They recruit for a long term purposes. <coughs> and if you see the differences between the three organizations is that Fatah have lots of mal functions when it comes to suicide attacks. People, they change their mind in the last moment because their goal is really only secular. When it comes to the Fatah and Jihad, to Hamas and Jihad, sorry, 100% success. They have no failure, unless the, the vest didn't work, but no failure in, in manpower. When I ask terrorists from the Hamas group, what's the mistake of Fatah, to your opinion? They state one thing, and the same the Jihad people tell me. The mistake of the Fatah was that they only fight for the land of Palestine and only for the 67 border. We, unlike them, we fight and educate for the Islam, for the Quran. And therefore, we do the right job and they are infidels. They actually call the Fatah infidels. But what they say is, they are our brothers, they are wrong now. Inshallah, with the help of God, when we achieve our goal and we have this Islamic state, they will follow, they will come alone. But if they don't, we'll know what to do with them. And that will be the same as we do with you. In Israel, the numbers of suicide attacks went down dramatically. If I take the numbers from 2001 up to today, these are the figures. 2001, 21 suicide attacks in Israel. 2002, 36. 2003, it went down to 16. 2004, 9. 2005, 8. Okay? The use of this weapon went down dramatically, which means Israel found a way and managed to fight it. And here I disagree with the suggestions of how to fight it. In order to fight this type of weapon and organization, you need to have, first of all, a very good intelligence. The, that's why it, it, it took time. When we first addressed the, the problem at 2001, it took us until 2004 to minimize it by 85%. Before that, by 50%, but it takes time, which means I cannot decide today that I have a good intelligence tomorrow and it happens just like that. And I will bring you a little bit to the intelligence world. What is our agenda of what needs to happen in order to gather uh, intelligence information within hostile society? First of all, for a number of people between 7,000 to 10,000 in the population, of each, for each 7 to 10,000 people, the idea will be to have one operative intelligence person in charge, speak the local language, in our case it's Arabic, and he will need to recruit agents. This person will need to have to our objective between 30 to 40 agents. Again, this is the ideal. Whether you achieve it or not is a different story. We do achieve it. 
in the Palestinian uh, case. 30 to 40 agents. Now, third, the information needs to be gathered, collected by actual agents in the field, by people, which means you cannot rely on electronics. Operative person in charge needs to know about every little detail that happened in the area that he is in charge of. He needs to know about everything that happened either before, during, or after it happens. If he cannot achieve it, you don't have a good intelligence. Because we manage, and Israel is one of the leading countries, if not the leading country, in gathering information within a hostile population. Because we managed to achieve such a good uh, forgot the word in English now. Because we achieved such a good uh, measurements, we managed to cut down the problem of suicide attackers. And now when we have eight or nine a year, to our perspective, it's not much. It may sound to you a lot, but to our perspective, it's not much. It means, though, and that people don't understand, is that for these eight people that did uh, carry out a suicide attack, we catch around 80 in the Palestinian Authority on their way. That's what it means. But it takes a very good intelligence. It's the intelligence It's the key here, not the special forces. With all the respect to special forces, and I do respect special forces, that's what I used to do. We are dispensable because I can have a very good ability in penetrating to a certain hostile area and stay there for a few days undercover and then catch the guy or do something else instead of catching him. But if I don't have the information where he is, then I'm worthless. This is not the case in Iraq, to my knowledge. Again, my knowledge of Iraq and Al-Qaeda and all these organizations is not from primary sources. I cannot tell you that I spoke to Al-Qaeda member. I didn't. But to my knowledge, from college that, colleagues that do spe work with the Americans, just to understand the numbers, the Americans have one operative for around every 150,000 people of population. Remember the numbers? We said one for seven to 10,000, which means for that number, 150,000, you need to have between 15 to 21 operatives, not counting the agents they will have. In America, you have one, and in most of the cases, he has zero agents. His information would come from electronic measures. That means, and the terrorist knows it, that the ability to prevent a terror attack is almost zero. And don't fall after big noise. The fact that I bomb a lot doesn't mean I do much in order to prevent it. I can bomb Gaza as much as I want. The terrorists will keep coming. Why? For simple reason. I don't stop them. I just give hell to the population there, which they don't care. So the population is suffering from my shelling, but they will continue to come. And this is the case in Iraq. In Iraq, the organization spotted a window of opportunity. And that's why they are operating there. Not because, to my opinion, of an agenda, but because it's simply easier. It's easier to, uh, than coming to Israel. Al-Qaeda would love to, to operate in Israel. And they will in the future, since the withdrawal from Gaza and putting the, the policing of the border between Israel, between Egypt to Gaza, sorry, to the hand of the Egyptians. Al-Qaeda agents started to come. We cannot prevent it now. It's not in our hand. Soon we'll see them active. But until now, they didn't come because of ability. In Iraq, it's a problem. You arrest people, you don't know who they are. They tell you they are Isa. They are Isa. There's no way to verify it. That's why you will see that in Al-Qaeda, there are members for many uh, countries. If it's just to free Iraq, why don't, don't I see that just Iraqis? Why there are Syrians, uh, Saudi Arabians, and so on? If you remember, one of the claims that uh, Bin Laden had against the Saudi, uh, Saudi Arabia rulers is they are infidels. Why? 
because they don't obey the laws of Quran, the Sharia. And they are as bad as the Americans. It's not just about the Americans. Another accuse he has for King Fahed. When King Fahed gave $100 million to Yasser Arafat to support his struggle against the Israelis, Bin Laden attacked him. And the claim was that Arafat is a secular group that don't care for Islam, just for the land. Now, if it was really just fight about the land, then why not supporting a circular organization that fight for it? What's wrong with that? That's the goal. Not all the time. I would like to draw a few conclusions, and that, with your permission, I will read, because my English is not that good, and I want to make sure that the message is passed without any language barrier. First, the radical Islamic terrorist group that carry out suicide operation will never negotiate or compromise with Israel or the West. They are not allowed to do so by interpretation of their religion. It's important to understand according to what they say. Maybe in the future it will change, but now that's their views. Terminology is where is very important. When we listen to the demands of various organizations, we must make sure that we understand the intent. For the radical Islamic organization, the term occupied territories refer to the Dar al-Islam. And that is not just Iraq or the whole of Israel, but parts of Europe as well. One of the things you can see with Al-Qaeda, it wasn't just enough to drive this, the Soviets from Afghanistan. Without establishing the Islamic State run by the Taliban, the game was not over. Radical Islamic groups do an enormous amount of brainwashing. Some of the mocks are ho of the masks are hotbeds for of incitement, both in America and in Europe. Now, if in the past you saw that people joined the organization at the age of 19 or 21, now I see the terrorists or join the organization at the age of 12 to 14. The reason they manage to educate a new generation of Muslims that for them Islam is the only law. And unfortunately, they feel that they are constantly under threat by the West and they need to fight the West. Maybe some leaders started it as manipulation. But for the new generation, it's not a manipulation. This is the way they believe. We shouldn't focus our effort only on in <coughs> intercepting the lone suicide bomber, but should adopt a more comprehensive strategy aimed at those who preach radical Islamic messages and are raising a new generation of activists. One example is Zandani. I don't know how many of you know Zandani. You heard about Zandani, someone here? Zandani is one of the mentors of uh, Bin Laden. Now, this Zandani is running a university in Yemen. It's called the Jihad University. The program designed in a way that students are coming there for 10 years to study all aspects of Jihad. And I'm not talking about the philosophical part of it, but really how to do Jihad, how to raise money, how to launder money, how to raise arm, and so on. And it's designed that you do one semester of study, and then one semester you're practicing what you have studied. And then again, semester of study and then practicing. We don't know what the practicing involve. We don't have this information yet. But we do know that there's already few graduates, and they are all became members in the Al-Qaeda group. So basically, you have, you have here someone that runs university that is basically university for terror. is not even wanted. He's not a target. And my last message is, and this is, I think, the most important one, because if you don't get this, then I did a very bad job, is that those radical Islamic groups does not represent the Muslims whatsoever. The vast majority of Muslims are peace seekers and don't share these views. I'm talking only about the radical groups, which are very low in numbers and in percentage. 
They make a big noise, but they are very small in number, sorry. <coughs> and you shouldn't let them make it that this is the way Islam is. It will be the way of Islam only if we allow it to be. Thank you very much. Take the back row, John. Yeah, uh, this is for uh, Professor Clayton. I had a question. You noted some very clear correlations to where the suicide bombers come from. I was wondering, was there a correlation or pattern to where we find the train camps? Uh, well, you would think that, in fact, with Al Qaeda, that. Um, uh, there would have been suicide terrorists hopping out of Afghanistan because, after all, <laughs> bin Laden was in Afghanistan with training camps, um, uh, training, uh, doing a, a variety of training. And what's really striking is that there were two, if you happen to remember the slide, there were two from Afghanistan. That is, two Afghanis became al-Qaeda suicide attackers. They didn't join until 2002. That is, after we toppled the Taliban. And in fact, if you were to run the data even further, and of course I've seen that, so I've seen parts of it, it's not quite ready for prime time, but I've seen parts of it for around the world in 2004, um, you would see that in Uzbekistan, where we have a military base we've just put in, we've had our first suicide terrorist attacks ever in Uzbekistan, <laughs> and um, you would see in Afghanistan, um, there are actually, uh, we're up to about a dozen actually overall. It's actually growing fairly. So, in, so it doesn't correlate with training camps, which you might expect, <laughs> um, but it correlates with the presence of our ground troops, even where there's training camps. Anything more on that? I also had a question for Professor Kate. At the end of your presentation, you recommended that America should have offshore military power close to oil producing nations in order to protect the American oil supply. I was wondering what the economic consequences of withdrawing those troops would be. And I was also curious about why offshore troops do not provoke as much of a reaction as yeah. troops actually in the country. Yeah. Uh, let me take the second of your two questions first. Uh, it has to do with the issue uh, of urgency in terms of why the local community believes the foreign occupation is so urgent that they must respond uh, so quickly. Um, a good example of that is uh, Osama bin Laden's, um, in his speeches, uh, they're quoted in my book, but if you would just take the time to go and read some of his longer speeches, you would see uh, that they follow a similar pattern. They're about 40 pages long, but they're very similar. In 96, he published a speech, a sermon called The American Occupation of the Arabian Peninsula. That's the title. And they begin with the standard format, which is the first third are describing American combat operations on the Arabian Peninsula. Um, and then the middle is explaining that that's a problem and religion comes in because the Americans have a Christian crusader mission. <laughs> so he uses religion, all right, to paint us as Christian crusaders who are going to pursue various goals based on our a Christian agenda. I'm not saying there's any truth to that, but that's what he says. Uh, and then, in fact, in 96, he went on to say the reason this is urgent is because given the presence of the combat forces on the Arabian Peninsula at the time, we could expect the United States to conquer Iraq, break it into three pieces, and then do the same to other areas of the Arabian Peninsula. Well, of course, in 2003, we did that, and we put more forces in to do that. And so what's happened is you can see that the urgency of the response, so to speak, because he's making an appeal to recruit these walk-in volunteers that Ram is explaining. He's making an appeal to recruit them, and so he needs them to believe it's an urgent problem. It's got to be solved today, this year, not 10 years from now or so forth. In terms of economic, uh, well, we're spending um, 
um, you know, $120 billion this year. I mean, you know, we just, the uh, President just issued our budget, and the budget for Iraq is offline. So whatever numbers you saw in the paper, you have to add $120 billion for that, and that's just this year um, that's coming for Iraq. And so it's substantially cheaper to uh, deploy um, do the offshore balancing strategy. And moreover, we're now getting to the point where we're recycling many of our brigades through for the third time. That is, we're reaching the point where we're breaking our army uh, by having them go there, and I'd be glad to talk about that in more detail if you wish. But So there are some truly heavy costs to pay economically, both, both in the short term, 100 billion, 120 billion this year, and in the long term. We did break the American Army by 1975 in Vietnam, and it took us almost 15 years to rebuild that to a highly competent force. So that's extremely expensive. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering if you could speculate maybe on, uh, you mentioned in, in your talk about how, you know, we've not seen too many suicide bombers come from like Pakistan. Yeah, right. And I was wondering whether you could speculate, first of all, whether you think that some of that is due to the fact that President Bashar has maybe actually been cracking down on some of the mother shots and other sort of things. And I also speculate on whether he is you know, assassinated or, you know, removed from office in some way and some sort of Islamic fundamentalist uh, organization takes him from Pakistan, what effect that would have. Uh, great. Well, the J. There are four provinces in Pakistan. Uh, the J.I., which is uh, a radical <laughs> Islamic organization, is the government or part of the government in two in Northwest Frontier Province and Baluchistan. So we don't have to speculate what might happen if that were to happen. It's actually already there in at least the key part. That's where, of course, Bin Laden is up and hiding now. Uh, where, uh, how does that affect um, the ability to recruit and so forth and so on? Well, it's worthwhile noting that the four uh, bombers uh, from Britain, the four British bombers, they did not go uh, to Iraq to meet Zarqawi. They went to Pakistan. And in fact, we have videos of them with uh, the number two in Al Qaeda. Now, we don't know as a fact they met bin Laden, but um, it certainly was easy enough for them to get into the country and to get out. Uh, they had to lie to do it. You know, okay, they'll lie. Um, but the fact is, um, if they could come all that way, come in and out, and then do the operation, of course, <laughs> it would be, uh, you know, just easier on the other end. Not, pro not you know, piece of cake, but I mean, you've certainly got the, uh, the possibility. This also gives me a chance to tell you something interesting about those four bombers. There's an important reason why it's useful to not just simply swallow the religion argument all the way through. Partly it's because we can make actions that will make matters worse, but also in the tactical sense, we can give our intelligence uh, agencies the wrong outlook. To say what we should be doing is surveilling mosques, where we have very small pool, scarce pool of intelligence sources, I'm sure that's what the British government were doing in the summer, last summer. They were surveilling mosques. I have no doubt they did that out the gazoo. Those four bombers met in gyms because what connected them more than anything else was martial arts. Mohammed Khan was their martial arts teacher. He was a black belt. The others were members of his uh, school. And so if all you're doing, if you really buy that wholly, and I'm not doubting that religion plays a role, don't get me wrong, I wouldn't say that for a moment, but if you focus all your efforts, then in fact, tactically even, you might miss what's happening. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. I would like to comment that this has been a very lopsided presentation. I think you should have had somebody to represent the Palestinian point of view, because the Palestinians have been brutalized by the Israelis, the, and nobody knows, seems to remember, that David Ben-Gurion in the 20s said, when we become a majority, we will push the Arabs into the sea. And the Israelis had four different terrorist groups as they stole the lands, uprooted the olive groves, and, and murdered women and children and push them all into the refugee camps where they are now to this day. Is there a question? Oh, it's a comment. Oh, okay. the you want to comment on the topic? I just want to say one thing. Uh, first of all, is oh, towards the mic, we can lean forward. Yeah. As for representing the Palestinians that for the Dartmouth uh, okay organized. How about, the, can you hear this? Are these things on? Oh. Do you hear me now? <laughs> what, can he, what can we do? 
Not everybody has a booming voice like mine. Where's the, uh, <laughs> is this thing on? Anyway, I'll try to speak louder. Do you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I don't deny the right of the Palestinians to have their own uh, state. This is not the issue. If uh, someone took this message, then I don't hold it. They have the right to have their state, but as much as we have the right to have our state. That's why I don't have a problem with the Fatah, but I do have a problem with the Hamas and the Islamic Jihad, because they don't want the two-state solution. But if you want the two-state solution, then this is the, the way, this is the solution, to my opinion. Uh, sure. Um, would you therefore have any predictions for us about what will happen in the next year or so as we try to figure out what will happen with Hamas and Israel? It's hard to say. I was asked this question earlier. Um, first of all, usually what happens to terror organizations when they become involved in politics, they become more moderate. You can see it with the Hezbollah. Uh, <clears throat> Before they were involved with the politics, they could do whatever they like, simply because they didn't need to give answers to anyone. If Israel is bombing in Lebanon now and there is no electricity for a week, it's not their problem. The government of Lebanon should deal with the citizens. Now when they are part of it, they need to deal with it. So theoretically, it's, it's supposed to tell you that, yes, if they will become involved in the politics, they will have to become more, uh, as I said, grounded now and understand what the Fatah understood that you also need to live and ideals is one thing but there is also practice. There's two things that I will have to say before coming to a conclusion. First I have on one hand this positive statement that it happens to Hezbollah, why shouldn't it happen to Hamas and I really hope so it will. But on the other side I have my intelligence knowledge of their preparation for the third intifada. And I don't know if they will stop it. Basically, it takes time. We'll have to absorb it and to see. If they'll become really part of the politics, something will happen to them. If they will play games and make subgroups, that those groups will be the one in charge of the government, basically a government of technocrats, then it won't come. So, the answer will be, we'll have to wait and see what they'll do. It's too early. If I'll make statement now, I'll be a liar or a charlatan. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, yes. Uh, Professor Pei, um, in, your, in your talk, you mentioned uh, that, uh, the, I guess, the blueprint that the Norwegians found, yeah. or whatever, that, that said that they were going to uh, start, or was that the one that said they were going to start targeting Americans? Again. Uh, no, that's <clears throat> Ben Laden's right most recent statement. The Norwegian document right. is explaining that they're going to go after. Okay, so. the most recent statement then um, that they were going to—they've been targeting sort of the U.S. allies, and now they're going to go back and target the United States. Um, I guess um, when you know the, the terrorists, you know, targeted Spain. I guess you could say, yeah, that led to them pulling out of Iraq. But mm -hmm. obviously, you know, 9/11 when they hit the United States, you know, it had mm -hmm. the exact opposite effect. We invaded Afghanistan. And then yep. it went even further and invaded Iraq. Um, so I guess it would seem that that from the from the data at least that hitting the United States um, leads to us being more aggressive. I mean, do you know uh, have they yep. taken that into consideration? What their rationale is for continuing that strategy? Um, I'm afraid the answer to your question disturbing yes. And let me just preface this by saying that for 15 years before uh, I started 9-11, I studied um, air power, the limits of air power and so forth. I did that for five years here, but I also did it um, for three years teaching for the U.S. Air Force, where I had many, many smart, really smart people, and I wish I had smart people like you, but really smart American military officers um, trying to figure out how to coerce other states and so forth. What's really disturbing about that Norwegian document is it is excellent in terms of figuring out the limits and opportunities for coercion. The metric that is used to pick why they should hit Spain and not Britain right away and not Poland is a very simple metric. It's domestic public opinion in opposition to the war in Iraq. 
Spain was number one because 90% of the public believed there was no national security interest for, the Spain, for Spain in Iraq. Now, of course, a few people disagreed with that, but the fact is 90% of the Spanish public still thinks they had no business being in there and that it was a mistake to be there for core security reasons. Um, what's disturbing about also about bin Laden's most recent statement, which is only two pages long, but even in that two-page statement, what the metric he's using, why come at America now? And this are his words, because 60% of the American public wants out. They believe there's no security interest to having troops on the ground. Well, I'm, uh, that's extremely disturbing. First of all, it dovetails very tightly <laughs> with the logic before. And secondly, it's unfortunately an excellent logic. Now, um, I don't believe that means they can cause us to coerce us to get out and abandon our interest in oil. I think that actually even more 9-11s and even something worse than what happened on 9-11, we're not about to abandon oil in the Persian Gulf over the next few years. I think uh, that would crush our economy worse than probably the 1930s. I don't think we're up, we're going to do that, but I do think that it would be smart for us to anticipate all these issues, head them off with a more optimal strategy of offshore balancing, which does not cause us to give up our core interests, but actually uh, makes it much more difficult for them to generate suicide attackers to kill us. Uh, question the use of your uh, gory pictures. I mean, everybody on all sides of all conflicts has their own pictures or memories of cleaning up body parts as a result of victims of violence. One man's freedom fighter is another man's terrorist. Where is this going to end? It seems my outrage comes from the fact that we in our world feel that killing people is the answer to problems. And we, as the only superpower in the world, are the prime example of that. Go to war because we have a problem. Where is the hope for the future? Do my grandchildren, when they grow, have to still take their shoes off at airport uh, check sites? First, I hope no. And, uh, you know, in this way, this generation used to say to his kids, when you will grow up, you won't have to go to the army. But Israel is a militaristic nation. It and is. It's one conflict responding to a conflict, and it goes on and on and on ad nauseum. If it will stop, my opinion is, <clears throat> first, if you will improve the life of the people in those places, and that basically, the, in the Israeli case, the life of the Palestinians. <coughs> working now? No. <coughs> in the Israeli case, um, to improve the life of the Palestinians, the life of the Palestinians today is much worse than it was before the Intifada started, or than it was when Israel was there. And there's something to understand. Because of corrupted uh, government, whatever, because most of the money goes for the military struggle, whatever. But once the whole world, and this is a job for the whole world, it's not a job for Israel alone. Israel simply don't have the means to do it. With all the respect to mighty Israel, Israel cannot do it. The, the most Israel can do is A, to fight it, as you said. Unfortunately, side by side, we're talking, you have to fight as well at the same time. Because it's one thing to talk about suicide bombers here. It's another thing to live in Tel Aviv. So I can speak about the solution. But in the meantime, if I know that there's a suicide bomber in Janine on its way, I have a very fast decision to make. Either I go to catch him in order to prevent him from exploding in Tel Aviv or Natania, or I decide to stop this blood circle and not going, and then he will explode. So I have to do it. But I can tell you for the Israeli side, and it's something that maybe is not understood, Israel does more than the minimum, and this is understatement, to improve the lives of the Palestinians. Example, we supply the electricity to the Palestinian Authority. All of it, not just part of the electricity. Israel could stop this supply if they want to revenge. 
or they want to put sanction on them. Israel doesn't do it. I don't know how many countries you know in the world that have a state of war with the neighbor and they do supply electricity to them. Or build walls to keep them from getting to their olive groves. Okay. I, wait, wait. Let's let, collect questions in the First, let, manner, let me answer a second. Lot, let's not become demagogic. I collect wall in my place in order to prevent from you to come in if, to come in if you want to kill me. If you had a war with Canada and you decided to build a wall, you wouldn't now criticize it. So let's not be uh, charlatans on that thing. This is a, a, a survival for us. If I wouldn't make walls and I go to kill them, then it wouldn't be better. So I make walls, which, by the way, were built by Canadian. The only place that there's the conflict <laughs> wall and not <laughs> defense, it's, it's because this wall was made, people don't know it, by a Canadian company for one reason. This wall was supposed to guard the highway so people would use the highway before there was even a decision to make a, a security defense, okay? So this is one thing. Other thing, Israel collect taxes at the uh, East Jerusalem. This money goes to the Palestinian Authority. Half of the budget of Palestinian Authority goes from these taxes. Israel deliver this money. They attack us and we give the money. Even now, when Hamas went on power, we still delivered the money. So, nothing is black and white. No one is the righteous here, and no one is the saint here. But also, don't make that we are the sinners. Everyone have his good side and bad side. Once we understand that, and we try to bridge between, something will happen. But once each one will hold the, the, the stand that one side is the sinner, the other side is the, the right one, then yeah, it will stay this bloodshed. That's my whole point. Well, 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 let's let, 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 let's let someone else ask a question. Himself. Yes, sir. Uh, objecting, since I don't see any solution to this in the near term, uh, projecting 15 or 20 years down the road with the, uh, the Hindu or Indian influence and the Chinese influence in the Middle East, which is actually happening right now as we speak, they're buying up or in the Sudan making contrasts, because in fact the, the world does run on oil. Um, what do you see as the, the purpose in protecting our interests of having any kind of offshore military presence uh, when the competition is going to be much keener? Uh, well, actually, one of the um um, in the last few months, I've not only spoken to American politicians, but the IAEA, uh, the International Atomic Energy uh, Agency, has had some conferences, and so I've had the opportunity to speak with. Uh, and um, the, uh, there's one thing about the threat of terrorism, uh, which is that um, it is, uh, these are non-state actors attacking states. And even if, in fact, they're uh, doing attacks in states where they're attacking and targeting the victim, the citizens of other countries, states don't like terrorist attacks occurring in their states. They just simply don't. And so one of the arguments I've been uh, making is that there is something of an opportunity here to make um, this concept of offshore balancing not a American unilateral dominated um, uh, but in fact, um, a concept that we should be working with, uh, not just simply our European allies, um, that is, um, you know, um, uh, Britain and France, which we have often done in the, in, the, in the Persian Gulf, but also it would be a very useful thing to bring on board uh, the Chinese um, and the Japanese. And I think that that's, so for, in my mind, it serves as an opportunity, what you describe, but uh, yes, you're right, there are some countervailing pressures, but on the other side of that, we should recognize that we do have um, some commonality on which we at least have a basis for discussion. Yes, the young man in the back, you've had your hand up for a long time. Yes, you. Yeah. I have a question for, Pet for Professor Pate concerning um, one of the statistics you cited in reference to London bombings. Yeah. Um, specifically, you said between 8 and 14 percent um, of Muslims in uh, England uh, believe that suicide uh, bombings were justified because of the, um, the war in Iraq. Uh, 8 and 13 percent wanted more attacks. Wanted more attacks. Um, and my question is, Concerns the breakdown of that statistic. Uh, of those uh, eight to thirteen percent, um, uh, who of them were were actually 
immigrants from Iraq, because if most of them, oh, uh, unless right. a sizable majority of them were from Iraq, it would seem to suggest um, that uh, that their motivations were more religious. Uh, yeah. religious well, well, first of all, it's a four-volume survey. It's available if you go to the London Times website and you start clicking in some of these phrases I've just given you, you can find it and read it for yourself. Um, it's about three or four hundred pages long. Um, I'm almost sure that it is, uh, it is not the case. I there'll, can't there'll be a quiz on Wednesday. <laughs> okay, so I'm almost sure it's not the case that you are, you're picking up uh, immigrants from uh, Iraq as the dominant uh, uh, force here because, in fact, the whole survey begins by laying out the different generations of the different immigrants. So I don't believe that's the case, but I, I, I just tell you that uh, um, I don't think, I, I, by the way, uh, I just don't think that, that would, that's the case. It's just not enough N to account for that, that fraction. Um, and the reason it's 8 to 13 percent is because they did different surveys and they got different numbers and that's the spread. Yes, sir, in the back. I'm not sure where you disagree with the Bush administration. Should we pull out in a year no matter what the situation is on the ground in Iraq or, and then, um, we should, you, one of your talking points on the screen said we should turn over uh, more of Iraq to Iraqis. It seems to me that's what Bush is doing. Quite a bit of military bases have been turned over to the Iraqis. I'm not sure where you stand. Yeah. Well, uh, starting last uh, June is when I first went to Capitol Hill and first began to present these three points. Um, during that period of time, um, there's been some movement by the Bush administration. One of the big things I didn't complain here about, but that I complained about last June, was the effort by Condi Rice to micromanage a lot of the political outcomes and that we should, above all else, as we got into August and the fall, keep our hands off the whole issue of the Iraqi Constitution. And in fact, the Bush administration did that. I could not, probably not because I said anything about it, but simply would have was the uh, a better outcome and in fact it has produced a uh, better outcome. Um, in terms of um, uh, the actual metric to watch, however, I am calling for them not to wait for the violence to die down. I am calling for them to gradually withdraw our, all of our combat forces uh, on the ground from Iraq and the Arabian Peninsula by the end of Bush's uh, term, because if we wait for the violence to die down, since our presence is the main cause of it, that will never, that drawdown is never going to happen. Um, in the last few months, the thing that's very interesting is Bush has, of course, given a very famous set of speeches, I'm sure you've seen, where he said, oh, God, we'll never uh, uh, give in, we're not going to cave in to terrorism. Well, you should know that the key thing to watch is not what he says, but what we're actually doing with our, we have 17 combat brigades, that's the number, in Iraq. Two are slated to leave in March, and for the first time ever, those 17, those two, will not be backfilled by two others. This is the first time. The two units that were supposed to backfill, one from Kansas and one from West Germany, had been on the docket in December. They have been canceled. So in other words, as things now stand, and it looks we're getting pretty late into Mar close to March, we look like we are going to have the first actual reduction of combat brigades, and that's the core metric, um, from 17 to 15, and that looks like it's going to be followed by several others over the course of the year. Um, the fact is, uh, I think that's terrific. Um, I've been very critical of the Bush administration. Um, this point I'm making, actually, uh, some Democrats don't like it because it makes them seem like they're doing the right thing. I'm sorry about that. I'm not really coming at this from one or the other <laughs> uh, side. Um, but that's the thing to watch, is the number of combat brigades. And if we're down to, say, um, uh, 12 or 13 by next December, I think that will end up being a good thing. Uh, yes, in the back here. Yeah. Um, you explained at one point how many of the Hamas recruits needed to um, stand as civil servants almost in Palestine for a certain amount of time as um, uh, charity members or as fundraising and whatnot. And I was wondering what would happen if Israel um, provided the uh, took over some of the roles of providing many of the civil services to the Palestinians instead of allowing Hamas to do that and thus giving them credibility with the Palestinian people. You simply cannot. It's not your place. 
It's Palestinian Authority. It's not under Israel. We withdrew from it. Is that it? That's good. That's the answer? It's, it's not okay. Israel. <laughs> okay. Okay, yes, ma'am. You talk, Mr. City, about the majority of Muslims who want peace or just normal average people seeking a good life for themselves and their children in the future. Is there any movement within the non-Islamicized Muslims in Palestine? Is there any bubbling up of a peace movement Palestine, as to in That's the problem. In the Palestinian Authority, the situation for now, it's very complex. Terror is very strong inside the Palestinian Authority as well, much worse than in Israel. Just to understand numbers, in the Palestinian Authority now, we have 25,000 people that carry arms that does not belong to the Palestinian Authority and does not belong to Hamas or Jihad. They are just independents, gangsters, groups that carry rifles and do whatever they like. Now understand the number, 25,000, it's a small army. Now these groups get paid from the Palestinian Authority. It's a, it's a, extortion money, if they don't pay, if they will not pay them, they will kill some of their families, whatever, and they did. They're basically terrorizing. They can come, let's say, and say, you have a building of four <coughs> stores, one store it's ours from now on. And that's it, that's in the good case. In the worst case, they'll take the whole building, there's nothing you can do. What happened is that there were voices that tried to say that this is not Quran. They were shot, they were killed. Light, for example, it's not the same case. It wasn't on a religious base, but the assassination of the brother of the mayor of Nablus that was done by the uh, Al-Aqsa Brigade was on disputes of how to do certain things. And there's fear there. Now, when you speak to people, not in front of the camera, when I speak to Palestinians, many of them says they would wish that this situation will stop. They don't want the terror anymore. They would wish that normalization will come. But they cannot speak out loud because they don't have the ability to do it. And listen, you can be very brave. When I hold an AK-47 in front of your head, you have a problem if you don't have one. As brave as you are, I'm, I'm honest on that. Somebody over there. Uh, last question, yes. Uh, Professor Pick, you, um, one of the statistics you cited showed that the largest number of Al Qaeda suicide bombs came from Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. But one thing that struck me was that the second largest group came from Morocco. Mm -hmm. And the reasons are obvious for Saudi Arabia, but I wish you'd elaborate on why Morocco in particular. Yeah, the book goes in much greater detail and has a whole chapter about um, Al Qaeda's transnational suicide terrorists. One of the key things to notice, uh, especially with Morocco and Egypt, um, is that they are coming from some from the what are called the repressive Muslim regimes, which are our best friends. <laughs> so Morocco is widely viewed, the government of Morocco is widely viewed inside Morocco as an illegitimate government. It's not a democratically elected government. It's an authoritarian regime that we have given over a billion dollars to over the last two decades. It's been, if you know our foreign aid budget, this is a lot of money. We don't give that kind of money very easily. And in fact, um, so there are some other sources of our foreign policy which are contributing to this beyond simply the presence of our forces. So I, I do try to say there are multiple causes. There's one cause that's head and shoulders above the others. Uh, the others are certainly consistent with that. Um, but there are some others, and they're, and they're in the book. Well, thanks very much, ladies and gentlemen. Join me in the